One of my sweetest husbands. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, somebody. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I thank my sister for inviting me to come talk to you this morning on God's health plan for you. Have you heard me speak this year? Yes. Um, by show of hand, let me see who's had me speak. Okay, so I see six people. So these six people are on a PhD level on health talk. <laughs> and the rest of you are in the elementary school. Uh, so if I have any questions, I know who to direct my questions. <laughs> All right, praise the Lord. So my sister, my sister asked me, Sister Mary asked me to talk about God's own plan for you. God's own health plan for you. Usually I've been asked to talk about women's health in a women's conference. But when she said God's own health plan for you, I start to ask myself, does God really have a health plan for me? Does he? Do you think he has a health plan for you? Of course he does. But I've never really thought about it that way. At the same token, I've always said the Bible is a full book. It has something to be said about every situation in life. And so it has to have something to say about health. And so I did the little research. And of course, thank God for internet. It's so easy to research topic now. Just put the topic, God's own health plan for you. And a bunch of stuff came out. So, in full disclosure, I got a lot of things from the internet. So I'm going to uh, mix and match the biblical reference on health with the now medical reference on health. Praise the Lord. Now, the Bible says that our body is the temple of God. And so if my body is the temple of God, what, do I, what are my responsibility to keep that body, that temple that God has given me? What are my responsibility to keep it wholesome? I'd like for someone to read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. 1 Corinthians. Not 1 Corinthians. Has any of you voted this morning? One person? Please perform your civic responsibility when you get out of here. Today is the uh, Louisiana primaries. Yes. Yes. So please, uh, people lay down their lives so that we can vote. Yes. So uh, first Corinthians. Yes, ma'am. So go on and read 6, 19 through 20. Six, nineteen to twenty says, Do you know do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You're not your own. Twenty says, You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. It says to honor God with our body. And then, God is not just interested in our soul. We've been feeding our soul this morning. Thank God for my sister, for the sweet word that you delivered this morning. And I, I thank for the sisters also with their skin. He's not just interested in our soul. He's interested in our body. Third John uh, chapter 1 says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. So our spiritual well-being is vital 
but our physical well-being is equally important. Yes, yes. So we shouldn't just get all spiritual and feed the soul. We have to feed not just the soul, we need to also take care of the physical body where God resides. Praise the Lord. Do I have someone there who's going to help me? Slide or I can do it here. Okay, thank you. So there are different forms of um, different forms of um, sins. The physical sin, which is what we get when we have all this physical ailment, and then there's the spiritual sin. Both of them will paralyze us from achieving God's purpose for our life. Amen. Amen. Now, in order for us to stay healthy, we have to take precise steps. There are certain precise steps that we need to take, and I'll kind of walk you through that. I'm not going to be reading my slides, so you can take a look at the slides as we move along. So, today, I want you to always remember new start, because we're going to have a new start as far as it relates to our health. And the new start start for uh, the acronym nutrition, exercise, water, sleep, sunlight, temperance, air, rest, and trust in God. And it's interesting that the Bible talks about each of these things as it relates to us. So, nutrition. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, it says to eat and drink to the glory of God. Eat and drink to the glory of God. So whatever you're doing, you're doing it to the glory of God. So what, is exact, what exactly is good nutrition for us? What's God's plan for our nutrition? I'll take you back to Genesis when God created uh, Adam and Eve. He actually gave them a nutrition plan. So look at uh, Genesis chapter 1 verse 29. That was the nutrition plan that God gave um, Adam and Eve. If somebody has it, could you please read? Amen. Then God said, I give you every seed that creeps on the ground and Praise the Lord. Just, just that um, 29. So when God created Adam and Eve, the nutritional plan that he had were whole grains, seeds, and fruits. That was it. And if you go down uh, Genesis, when you get to Genesis chapter 2 and 16, he added some uh, herbs. So the whole grain, nuts, and the seeds, and the fruit. He now added some herbs. So that was God's nutrition plan for human being. And then as years go by, we started adding this and we add that and we were where we are today, to where we're eating a bunch of stuff that wasn't actually what God designed to be. You all also remember Daniel, when uh, I think it was King Nebuchadnezzar, when he came and got all these handsome, good looking men, strong, wise, young, uh, and he wanted them to eat in his palace and eat the choices of food so that he can, they can be helping him in the palace. But one thing Daniel did, Daniel determined in his heart that he wasn't going to be eating the king's food. So as we get richer and God's blessing us with all this abundance, we move away from that healthy eating habit that we should have. Now, if you look back and see what did Daniel eat, while all the other guys in the palace were having the nutritious meat and all of that and drinking, what did Daniel, Abednego, and the other guys eat? Does anyone know what they ate? Vegetables. So God actually, the Bible is full of different um, verses that tells us what a good meal is. Am I calling you to be vegetarian? I'm not calling you to be vegetarian. I'm just telling you what the Bible says about what a good nutrition is. And absolutely, is being a vegetarian good? Yes, it is good. 
The Bible also says that we should do everything in moderation. Now, if you are eating whatever food you are eating, are you, whenever I go to a restaurant, they have a 16 ounce steak that fills the whole plate and the entire little vegetable on the side of it. So we have it backwards. We're eating all this big meat and we're moving away from the vegetables as it was designed to be in the past. The Bible also says that we should eat at regular intervals. So you can't just be eating all day long and grazing all day long and eat this bar and then eat this um, chips and then sit down to eat at night. And then when you sit down to eat at night, you just knock it all out and clear the table. So if you, I'm not, we're not going to read all the verses, but if you go to es Esclatea, I can't say that word, Esclatea says, um, chapter 10, verse 17. It actually talks to us to eat at good intervals. You can't just sit there and be eating all day long. Now, the Bible talks to us about not eating animal fat. It's there in the Bible. Look at Leviticus 3 and 17. It says, don't eat animal fat and uh, blood. So, I hope you're taking down those references. I want you to look it up. So, these are not things that doctors make up. These are the things that are there in the Bible. Now, the Bible also talks about not overeating. If you look at Proverbs chapter 23, verse, verse 2. Actually, I do want someone to read that. Proverbs 23, 2. So, saying to put a knife to thy throat is just a figure of speech. It's, don't be given to too much appetite. Don't over eat. Don't over indulge. It's what that Bible uh, Bible passage is referring to. Now, today's medical science. What is the recommendation? Your daily requirement of fat is about um, 480 calories. Or 50 grams of fat. Now let's put it into perspective. Your daily calorie requirement is about 1500 calories. So when you go to the grocery store, make it a habit to start looking at the nutritional uh, information that is on there. So I can give you an estimate when it tells you to eat 1500, um, 1500 calories per day. So you can put it into perspective. When you decide to eat those um, What's that bone that has uh, cinnamon? Cinnamon rolls. Okay, when I just got to America, I'll divert a little bit. Um, in my residency program, they have this cafeteria that make fresh cinnamon rolls. And you walk into the cafeteria. This is a hospital cafeteria. You walk into the cafeteria and you smell it. I couldn't resist it. So every day, I ate a cinnamon roll. And then down the street, it's uh, a, a place where they make cheesecake. So <laughs> I bought the big box of cheesecake and my husband and I, we just devoured it. And this is just coming to America. Of course in Nigeria, we didn't have uh, cheesecake. Uh, we didn't have cinnamon roll. And so uh, that was my new fountain. And of course I gained a lot of weight in that my first year in my residency. And as I got more informed and more educated in what is right and what is not right, I started giving away all the, uh, uh, the bad deal. If I do that now in, at this age, it'd be hard for me to get rid of those calories that I eat. So but earlier on in my life, I was able to get rid of that. But uh, coming back to our topic here, I'm saying that all facts are not created equal. Um, the, the passage that I referred you to, Leviticus uh, 3, 17 talks about animal fat that we shouldn't eat animal fat so we have saturated fat which is the animal fat and we have the uh, unsaturated fat and um, the polyunsaturated fat comes from those seeds and some fish and then we have mono unsaturated fat which helps us to lower our LDL now LDL is the bad cholesterol so that's the one that you want to be lower. So now, it does see on here that you can have some fat, but put it into context that one table, one um, teaspoon, I'm trying to take that back, one tablespoon of oil 
is about 120 calories, and you could only have 480 calories of fat per day. So that's four tablespoons, and that's it that you can have per day. Now, so the wisdom here is to eat less fat, increase um, your fruits, your vegetables, your salads, your nuts. So those are things you want to increase. And um, cut down on the carbs. Carbs like your rice, your pasta, and your pastries. Um, cut down on those and increase all the other vegetables, like you said in Genesis that we, we read earlier. So that would kind of be a nutshell about nutrition. And now going to uh, back to our new start for E. So E here is exercise. And then I asked, what does the Bible say about exercise? As a matter of fact, the Bible does say something about exercise. So if you look at uh, uh, Timothy 4, 7 through 8, it says that you need to do some other things. Exercise is important. Don't focus too much on exercise. Um, but you do need to do exercise. There are some people that live in the gym. Um, you think they're going to be running for Olympic. You're not preparing to run for Olympic. You're just wanting to keep your body, that temple of God, you're trying to keep it healthy. So some exercise, about 30 minutes every day. Um, it's my normal Monday. Yeah, so about 30 minutes of exercise um, every day. Or if you decide to do 20 minutes of heavy breathing three times a week. So um, it's important. They're now saying that the new tobacco is just sitting down. Like you're sitting down here. So at that point, I want all of you to get up. All right, everybody please get up. All right, so when you're at work, if your job requires that you're sitting by the desk, every hour, get up, move around your office, and then sit down back, please sit down. Yeah. Oh, please get up again. <laughs> Thank you. You may sit. Thank you. Yeah. So the new tobacco is just sitting down. So all of you are aware of what tobacco does to the body. Now imagine if they're saying that the new tobacco is just being sitting down all day. Put that at the back of your mind so you know you're not going to be sitting down all day. Exercise helps pump your heart, helps circulate blood all over your body, and keeps you from having some of these diseases. Um, and I have one here, there's nothing that improves your life expectancy more than exercise does. So if you're not already doing exercise, you should consider it a priority right now. So by show of hand, who has done any kind of exercise in the last week? Praise the Lord. This is the audience that I've spoken with that are more in tune with exercise than anybody else. And I can tell you, it's something that we all struggle with because we have so many things on our place. We have to go here, we have to go there. We are constantly juggling things and we put things that we consider less important out of the equation. Exercise is very important to keep us healthy. And um, it does actually increase life expectancy. So again, the, the, the next thing we're going to talk about here is water. So your body as you're sitting down there, 65% of your body is actually water. And in order to keep your body healthy, you have to drink a lot of water to get rid of some toxins. It helps to flux your kidneys. It helps to keep your cells um, the way they should be, kind of the balance that they should have. So exercise is, I mean, I'm sorry, um, water is very important. So drink a lot of water, um, and that's good for your health. Now, sleep. So I'm going to talk about sleep uh, in the sense that the Bible also gives recipe for sleep. So let's look at um, as, as that that I can see. As Ecclesiastes five and twelve. As Ecclesiastes five and twelve. Um, the Bible says that God gives His select sweet sleep, and God doesn't promise us something that He won't give us. If he promises us, he will give us. So, 
the statistics shows that 14% of women in their 30s and about 31% in their 80s have sleep disorders. That's us women. So I can easily say that a third of us here, sitting here, a third of us do not enjoy good sleep. So, and there are different reasons why people have a sleep disorder, a sleep disorder. And there are things, steps that we could do to, uh, to keep us from having uh, those sleep disorders. Uh, stress, taking stimulants like coffee. Let me tell you my coffee story. Does anyone here drink coffee? Anyone? Again, this is a perfect audience. Sometimes when I speak, everybody drinks coffee. So here's my coffee story. When I walk into the building I work, I get a giant cup of coffee every, every Monday through Friday. And I, yeah, I drink every day. And it keeps my adrenaline going, it keeps me going. On Saturday, when I don't want to go anywhere, and I'm laying on my bed to relax, I have to get up because I have a pounding headache from coffee withdrawal. And when you go get that cup of coffee, by the time I drink a quarter of the cup, the headache just fizzles away. I mean, completely gone, and I'm fine. The same thing on Sunday. I have to have, I had to have that cup of coffee, and I started to think, say to myself, this thing is controlling me. This coffee is actually, it's an addiction. That's a definition of addiction. Although it's there, easily accessible, it's an addiction. If you have to do something that you don't want to do, but you have to do it because your body is calling for it, for it, and if you don't do it, you go through withdrawal which the headache is a withdrawal headache, it's an addiction. And of course, because it's a stimulant, it keeps you awake at night. And so I said, no, nothing is gonna control my life. So I decided that I was gonna quit cold turkey. And we went on vacation, I, I kept that um, quitting till vacation. So we were in uh, Disney World when I decided to quit. I almost ruined the vacation from it for everybody because it was bad headache. Like, like somebody put an ax to my brain. Literally was what it was. And after the two weeks, I didn't drink caffeine anymore. Not even caffeinated beverage like Coca-Cola or Pepsi. Don't deal with all of that for other reasons. So coffee is a stimulant that will keep you awake all at night as well as some other untoward side effect that he has. Now, because of absence of sleep, you can now develop some other diseases, you know. So those are things that you need to watch out, watch out for. Look for stimulants. It's good to exercise, but not exercise within three hours of bedtime. Um, and when you talk about caffeine, you have to remember other things that have caffeine in it, chocolate, tea. So if you have to drink tea, think the caffeine tea, tea close to bedtime. And then um, on weekends, you should try and get an extra or two hours of sleep to be able to get the required eight hours of sleep that you need per day. Now, going back to our uh, new start, uh, the next thing on there is sunlight. There are different um, things that we benefit from sunlight, um, vitamin D from sunlight. Uh, sometimes it helps the, the warmth that we get from sunlight helps. It's been shown that during the time that you don't have sun, sunlight, a lot of people go into depression. It helps the mood. Uh, they talk about the sun helping to prevent certain diseases. So sunlight is actually very good. Just don't stay in the all night. Get out and enjoy the gift of God, the fresh air, the sunlight and all that. Go outside and enjoy. Go to the park. Walk in the park. You know, just don't stay at home and be a couch potato. Now, temperance. The Bible says, do everything in moderation. Let somebody open First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. First Corinthians 9, 25. We should do everything in moderation. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. 
last forever. Amen. Um, we should do everything in moderation. Um, eat in moderation. Um, even the exercise that we talk about, do it in moderation, not more than what we just prescribed. Not just to have a perfect body, but to stay healthy. Um, now, we already talked about air and going to the park and just enjoying, just taking deep, slow, deep breath. It helps you to relax. It helps you to get rid of the stresses that women have. And it also helps you not to be uh, overwhelmed with the affairs of the world. It gets you in tune with God. You can move away from all the craziness going on around you. And a good time to meditate, like just go in the park and walk the park in the evening, taking the fresh air and prayerfully doing your walk around the park. So you can actually achieve a lot of things when you take those evening strolls. Now, we're going to talk about rest, which rest and sleep I kind of put together. The Bible says it's vain to rise up. You know, and look, actually, let's have somebody open that. Um, Psalm 127, 127, verse 2. heart that I'm going to rest. I'm going to have a sweet sleep. Now, let somebody else read um, Exodus 29 and 10. Exodus 29 and 10. Verses 9 and 10 is me. 20 verses 9 and 10. Six days shall thou labor all thy work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath unto Jehovah thy God. Amen. Even when God created the earth, He created everything. He did this on the first day, He did this on the second day, and on the seventh day, He rested. If God, the creator of heaven and earth, if He took a rest, why am I spinning my wheel? So when we plan our day, we should inculcate that one day of rest. In addition to having eight hours of sleep per day, that one day of rest, we should put it in there. For me, it might be a Tuesday, for you it might be a Saturday, for you it might be a Sunday. We all have different professions and different jobs. But get that one day of rest that you put on your schedule and learn to say no. Don't say yes to this activity and yes to that activity. You are a deaconess, you are, you are a minister, you are this, you don't want to, you, you're serving this person, you're serving, you're busy doing business without thinking about resting so that you can rejuvenate and refresh your, yourself. So the last one that I have on here says trust in God. Um, health comes from obedience to God. I don't care what we've been talking about. If we're not obedient to God and to God's word, we cannot have good health. Um, so someone should read Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 to 22. Proverbs 4, 20 to 22. Sister, why do you have that open? Read 19 and 23. 19, 23. 
Yes, ma'am. I thought it's the old fashioned Bible that you just go to the next page. Okay, yes, ma'am. 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 Yes, Amen. Who has another version? What version did you just read? Yes, okay, sorry. Is it so, 19? 19, okay. 19, 23. A man of great wrath shall bear the penalty. For if thou deliver him, thou must do it yet again. Okay, so let somebody else read 19, 23. A man of great wrath shall suffer punishment. For if thou deliver him, yet thou must do it again. Hear counsel and receive instruction, that thou mayest be wise in thy later days. Praise that you. Amen. The fear of the Lord leads to life. Once you sleep at night without danger. Amen. The fear of the Lord brings life. The fear of the Lord brings life. So, if we trust in God, we obey His commandments, He keeps us in health, He brings us life. Praise the Lord. So, those are some Bible references that speak to health and to the importance of being in good health. So that, as He promised His people, we will not have any of these diseases. So, we're going to talk about these diseases. The diseases that we're talking about now, in the Bible time, they didn't have names. There was no hypertension. There was no stroke. There was none of those. Uh, as medical sciences have advanced, we've given them names. The Bible says we will not have any of these diseases. Amen. So we're going to move on and talk about some diseases that are common now. And the first thing that we'll talk about is um, high blood pressure, hypertension. You, you, can, you can move down, my brother. Keep going. Keep going. So I'm going to talk about keep going on to get to one that says hypertension. Okay, he doesn't have it. Um, I'm going to talk about hypertension. I think we just leave the slide alone. Now, hypertension is one of the commonest diseases in our population. Um, we black folks, Africans, African Americans. Um, it runs in the family, and diseases that run in the family tend to go from one generation to the other. Thank you. Um, one in five adults in the United States has high blood pressure. So I can see about um, six, eight of us sitting down here has high blood pressure. Um, so the things that will cause high blood pressure, stress, eating too much salt, um, there are some other diseases like kidney diseases that will cause high blood pressure. And all of those cause hardening of the blood vessels. And when, when there's high blood pressure, it leads to something else. When there's hardening of the blood vessel, that means organs are not receiving adequate blood. The brain is not receiving adequate blood. The heart itself is not re receiving adequate blood. The kidneys are not receiving adequate blood. And all those things can lead to what we call end-stage renal disease, meaning the kidney quit working, and that person needing dialysis can lead to stroke, um, can lead to heart attack. So having high blood pressure, who knows, let me ask another way, who here has checked her blood pressure in the last week? Yeah, that is classic. People, you should check your blood pressure. But the Bible says that my people perish for lack of knowledge. The bad thing about high blood pressure is that it doesn't give any symptom. Your blood pressure could be high off the roof and you don't feel bad. When you feel bad, that's actually good because you know something is wrong, you can go get it checked. But when you don't know, it's a bad thing. A lot of people know that they have hypertension. I mean, Hypertension the first time that they have a stroke. Uh, have hypertension when they have a heart attack. That's the first time some people know that they have high blood pressure. 
So I put it to you, my sisters. Check your blood pressure. I'm sure who drove by Right Aid, Walgreens, or CVS on their way to this church this morning? You all drove by Walmart, uh, Walgreens. And those things are there. You can just, on your way, stop by, put your hand in there, and check. The normal blood pressure is around 120 over 80. If your numbers are higher than that, um, get your doctor to prescribe something for you. And if you have a medication that is already prescribed, take it. It, it, it saddens my heart that in our community, almost once a year, you hear somebody who had a stroke. You know, it, uh, it just makes my heart bleed because it's completely preventable. So check your numbers and know your numbers. Now, you can move on to the next one. Um, I kind of talked about all of this. Those are the end organ things that, go back, um, end organ things that the um, blood pressure will affect. Now, the other thing that I'm going to talk about is, well, I have congestive heart failure in there. When the heart fails to pump blood to the organs that it's required to pump blood to, and again, that could be from high blood pressure. So high blood pressure causes a lot of things. Um, the other thing, disease that is common amongst our population is stroke, not having the blood pressure adequately controlled. So, so many things that the blood pressure will do to us. Um, I cannot overemphasize the fact that we need to get that controlled. Now, there are other things, high cholesterol. We talked about our diet, things that we could do to get our diet, um, the appropriate diet. So the key thing that I want you to take away from here today is knowing that when you eat fruit, vegetables, nuts, and grains, your diet is in good track. And you can prevent having some of these diseases. Next slide. Um, the things that we call on here coronary arterial disease are what you probably know as heart attack or anginas, things that prevent blood not circulating to the blood to the um, heart appropriately. And I put on the right side the risk factors, high blood pressure, smoking, high cholesterol, being overweight, diabetes, inactive lifestyle and stress. And um, things that will help prevent um, the heart attack at the things on the right side. Okay, that'll be your right side, on the right side. Now, um, let's stop and talk about some of these things. Um, obesity. Now, does anyone here not have a cell phone? You all have a cell phone. Okay, so I want you to write down BMI, which stands for Body Mass Index, and Google it. When you Google it, look for BMI calculator. You know your height, you know your weight. It's going to tell you where you fall as far as your weight compared to your height, what your ideal weight should be, and what your BMI is. Our black folks, we say, I have big bones. That's why my BMI is high. Uh-uh. There are some people that their BMI should be high. Not everybody here. And those are the athletes that have muscles, dense muscles. So this BMI calculation doesn't help those people that we watch on TV playing football and basketball. So it doesn't work for them. But for you, if you know your BMI, I really do want you to check as I'm speaking. So if you know your BMI, you see where you stand. The other thing that I want you to check when you get home, take a tape measure and go across your waistline. Your waistline is that dimple that you have in your waist. If you do have that dimple, just go around and measure what is your waistline. If your waistline is more than 35, <coughs> For women, if it's more than 35, there's a higher risk of having a heart attack. I'm not here to scare anybody. I'm here just to just wake us up and let us know that we have things to do to stay healthy, to protect that temple that God gave us, to stay here longer. 
not to die, but to live to declare the glory of God in the land of the living. So if your waistline is more than 35, you need to start to do exercise. You need to change your diet to where um, your calorie can take is around 100, 1,500, to where you're not eating all the fat and the oil and the animal fat. Um, we've talked about stress and sedentary lifestyle. Uh, get active, get moving. I don't believe anybody smokes, but there's multiple studies that show what smoking does to the body, slowly destroying the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's not what we want to do. Now, um, the next slide that you showed on there, it's one that is dear to me, colorectal cancer screening. And that kind of takes me to talking about screening. When we talk about screening, it's checking for diseases that are common so that they can be prevented so that we don't suffer from the, that, that disease. And the one that I say that is dear to me is colon cancer. It's very common. Um, so I can't understand what I wrote on here. 1.22, I, I can't understand what I wrote there. Um, so it's very common in the United States. I think it's the number three killer next to heart diseases um, that will, people in the United States will die from colon cancer. And so there's this screening that at the age of 50, if you haven't had a colonoscopy, you should get that done. The reason that is dear to my heart is that's what I do for a profession, I'm a gastroenterologist. So if you haven't had your screening test, Done. When you have a screening test done, what well, the doctors look for are little polyps, like the size of a pimple. And that thing starts like the size of a pimple and gets bigger and gets bigger. And that's what gets to become colon cancer. So if you get a polyp at the state where it's too little, you get rid of it and you never develop colon cancer. In the last month alone, in the last month alone, I've seen people that came through my practice to have screening colonoscopy done. And there's six, one was 60, one was 70, and we diagnosed colon cancer. If they had had their colon cancer screening done earlier, we'll have gotten rid of the colon polyps. They never would have had um, colon cancer. And we, uh, black folks, say, oh, I don't, I don't want to go through all that. I don't want to, I don't want to find out, you know? If you don't know, what you don't know can kill you. Okay, so go get rid of it. I mean, go take care of it. Uh, other screening tests, your breast exam, which you carry your breast with you everywhere you go. So you can check your breast exam every day, or at least once a, once a week. For the younger women uh, that still have their cycle, do your breast exam right after you're done with your cycle. Get to know what your breast feels like. The mammogram is supposed to be done once a year one time a year. There's 365, 364 days that that exam is not done. And there are women that have been diagnosed with breast cancer in between two normal mammograms. So even the mammogram itself sometimes will miss breast cancer. But if you know how your own breast feels, it's yours, touch it. If you know how your own breast feels, if there's something that, that is there, that you didn't feel last week, get your doctor to check it out. Now, be your own advocate. Like when you go to see your doctor, don't get comfortable with the doctor saying that lump that you felt is nothing. Don't get comfortable with that. Because again, we've seen younger women that went to see their doctor because they're young, the doctor blew them off and doesn't proceed to check. If that doctor doesn't check it out, get a second opinion. And um, the other screening test that you should get on is your cholesterol, get that checked. For younger women, actually the older women too, get your pap smear done. The pap smear, get it done on an annual basis. Um, so those are some of the screening tests that are kind of pertains to us that we need to get checked on a routine basis. And for those of us that are married, push your husband to go get their prostate exam checked. Because that's one killer amongst 
African men, black men. Um, you can go towards the end of the slide. Um, so I'm going to say something to you that God has a plan for our health. And we need to follow those health plans that God has for us by doing the things that we've talked about, adequate and comprehensive nutrition, regular exercise, sleeping well, minimizing our stress level, knowing those common diseases and what to do to prevent those common diseases. I didn't talk about menopause and perimenopausal symptoms. Um, hot flashes, swinging moods uh, for those of us older folks. And there are things that we can do to prevent uh, those menopausal symptoms. There are um, hormone replacement therapy, there are over-the-counter things that we could take to prevent having those hot flashes. Um, so if you need to talk to me after the meeting, we can talk about that. I kind of jump and not talk about the uh, menopausal and perimenopausal symptoms. Now, we all need to take responsibility for our own health and um, do all those prevention things so we're not having to take prescription. If you have to take prescription, by all means we should, but as they say, prevention is better than cure. Um, you need to get informed and you need to get involved. Um, I like to say that when your doctor prescribes a treatment plan, please don't say no because if you don't have any health education, you cannot say no. Um, in the last couple of weeks, I've been um, involved with the care of two uh, blacks, African and African American. Uh, the one was diagnosed with a mass in their gallbladder. This doesn't look right. He wasn't feeling better than that, some little pain. He has good health insurance, has little pain in the area of his gallbladder. They did an ultrasound. There's something there that we're concerned about. We need to take a biopsy. He refused to take the biopsy because it's just a little pain that I have. He thought the doctors were just trying to make money and run off his health bill. And so he didn't get the biopsy done. He came back six months later, it's gotten bigger. At this time, now they did a biopsy. And it came back as cancer, but it spread all over. Even with that, he said, let's still take it out. Let's start your chemotherapy. Um, he still refused. Uh, he's no longer with us. Um, that would not be our portion in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I can tell you multiple story of a woman that had uh, breast cancer that was diagnosed early stages, refused to get a biopsy, refused to um, get any kind of treatment. She's no longer with us. If you have any doubt, there was also another uh, woman that had twins, one of the kids had some cardiac defect that needed surgery to repair early on in that baby's life and they refused. My husband is a pediatrician in that hospital and this woman is an African so they asked my husband to go talk to her. So he took an intervention from somebody who knows to explain to her and then she finally agreed and had the necessary surgery. Here's what I'm saying. If you're required to have a treatment, I know the history in this country with the medical people and, Afri and, and, and blacks, there's a history that makes us to be suspicious. But we cannot stay suspicious and not take care of ourselves. Get the information, get involved with your own care, and get a second opinion if there's, um, if there's a need to do that. Next slide. Now, um, God wants us to have an abundant life. Amen. And no health issues will stop us from having that life abundance in Jesus' name. Um, he wants us to be whole, soul, body, and mind. He wants us to prosper, be in health, even as our soul prospers. And uh, if we are obedient and follow what God says, we'll have greater blessing from God in regard to preventing uh, diseases. Praise the Lord. And he will not hold back anything that is good for us. He won't hold anything back that is good for us. So if for a reason God says don't eat animal fat, that's because it's not good for you. All right? So there are certain things that we need not to do. Don't eat animal fat. It's not good for you. 
So, um, in whatever we eat or drink, it should be to God's glory. Amen? Amen. Now, our bodies are not our own, gone. Um, the Holy Spirit dwells there, and we must glorify God in our bodies and spirit. Um, now, I'll say this again. God's original diet for man was vegetarian. So I'm not asking you to come to be vegetarian, but that's God's original plan, that we are vegetarian. It keeps us healthy. First um, John 3, 2 and 3. When we have the hope of Jesus coming, we will purify ourselves as he himself is pure. Praise the Lord. So on this point, I rest my case. I hope I've convinced you guys to go get your annual exam, to stay healthy, to do your exercise, to eat well, and be in health, even as your soul prospers. Praise the Lord. Amen.